Hey, what's up everyone? This is Micah hanging out here inside the Secret Studio. You know what's really cool is I have my buddy Maya who's hanging out on Skype today. And what's even cooler is with Maya, we have a special guest. Maya, who do we have here on Skype today? Steven Sater. Steven Sater, welcome. How are you doing, Steven? I'm okay, thank you. I'm locked down in New York City. <laughs> Yep, there's a, we have friends uh, all over the country who are uh, in their own version of lockdown, depending on uh, where they're at. So, glad you're doing all right. Thank you. Perfect. All right, yeah. well, Maya, take it away. Um, so, my first question for you is who or what inspired you to become a writer? Oh, um, you know, I think it was something I just knew about myself when I was very young. I um I wrote a novel when I was five. I printed it. My mom still has it. You know, I think it's just something. Um, I don't think that I grew up with some particular role model. I just think it was something I felt. You know, and I um I remember at my Sunday school I would write the plays and I wrote. You know, and I would. I was sick actually. I spent most of my childhood in and out of hospitals. And um, so I didn't go to school until um, but toward the end of sixth grade. I, I, I went, but not so often. I was home a great deal. And so I wrote um, plays and I would put them on with the neighborhood kids. Um, uh, so I don't know, it came to me, you know, something, something profound. Oh, cool. Yeah. Cool. Um, so how did you come up with the idea to turn the German play Spring Awakening into a musical? You know, um, when I first read Spring Awakening, um, actually I was in high school, um, and then I had the idea for many years kind of buried in me that I just thought that the play was like an opera waiting to happen. It was filled with all these young people and their their longings, their yearnings. And I thought these are like arias. They should be set to music one day. And then um, many years later, I met um, Duncan Sheik, the pop composer and artist. And um, we began writing songs together. And um, we actually met as Buddhists. We met, um, I went to his house to chant with him and we just hit it off in this very profound way and had this completely life altering meeting. But then we ended up writing two songs together. The first one began that night um, for a play of mine that was happening. And when Duncan came to see that play, this was in 1999, um, he said to me, you know, he had said to me, we'd now at this point, we've written three or four songs together and I had never aspired to writing lyrics. And I think he had never thought he would write songs with someone else. And he said, we should do an album together. And that was thrilling to me. So the first 13 lyrics I wrote ever were, became his, his next album. But also when he came to see the play, he thought it was cool. And he, I said, oh, we should do a piece of theater together. And he said, musical theater? And he made this face because he's not a fan of musical theater. He said, if I were do, working on something um, that was a musical, I wanted to do something that was cool outside the confines of musical theater, like cool to people, the general public, people, the culture at large. And the minute he said it, I just thought of Spring Awakening. I just thought young people everywhere have so much heartache and Adults aren't listening, and I thought we really have no idea what's going on in our young people's hearts. And so that gave us the real impetus to start. It was in 1999, and it took us eight years. I mean, eight years till we were like this hugely awarded thing on Broadway, and you know, it like changed all of our lives. Oh, wow. That's so cool. Um, so, what was the inspiration behind the songs? Well, it's sort of like you make the character's heart your own. And you go into a profound place of that, that place in yourself of discovering um, 
you know, whatever the moment is for the character at that time, like the young girl Vendla at the beginning, discovering she, her body's becoming a woman's body, or um, Moritz being completely stifled in school and freaked out by his puberty and, and upset by his teachers, and you just kind of go into that moment and you... I don't know, you find the, the poetry of that experience. And the way um, we write together, Duncan and I, I write the lyrics first and then he sets them. And almost 99% of the time he just sets verbatim what I give him. So what I give him kind of becomes the song. Um, and I come up with the concepts of the songs too. Um, and then he thrills me. When he writes, we write very separately. We don't write in, in that traditional way, like two guys at the piano together. We don't do that at all. Like mm -hmm. I write the lyric and then he sets it. I email it to him and he emails it back. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, I just wanted to show you. I actually have a Broadway bracelet with Spring uh -huh. Awakening on it. Mm -hmm. And then I also have the book. The book. Uh, and then I also have a Spring Awakening purse, so I'm just a little bit sad. You love it. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I've never actually seen Spring Awakening, but I'm obsessed with the soundtrack, and I've read so much about it, and I love how it deals with so many topics. Um, and do you have a favorite song from the soundtrack? Um, you know, it's sort of like asking a mother who is their favorite child, <laughs> you know, like I, um, you know, I have, they're all dear to me in their own ways. And when I listen to all of them, me, when I listen to them, I remember writing them. I remember writing the lyric. I remember often where I was. I remember the notes I got and where I was revising it, like that's, it all comes back to me. There are songs that I remember, um, for example, Left Behind. I remember sitting with my son in the theater and there's the lyric, the talks you never had, the Saturdays you never spent, all the grown up places you never went, because the, the young man has, has you know lost his life, he's killed himself, when the father is dealing with his grief. And um, I remember, saying to my son because I spent so much time in his early life in LA and I said you know I, I wrote this about the times we didn't have or the very last song Purple Summer when the, listen to what's in the heart of a child a song so big and one so small and I remember sitting with my daughter and saying you know I was th I was thinking of you when I wrote this so I have profound memories of all these songs and profound moments so I couldn't say a simple, I like that song best. Duncan will say that. Duncan will say, I like that. <laughs> I'm, I'm not that person. I'm, I'm attached to all of them in their own way. Oh, cool. Um, so, you, um, you were, so you worked with Duncan Sheik on Spring Awakening and then also Alice by Heart and then Nightingale. Mm -hmm. um, how did that relationship come about and what made you decide to start working together? I love Duncan. We met, as I said, um, chanting. And I think we share a kind of worldview or philosophy, a kind of sense of the potential of every human being to become happy mm. and to have a fulfilled life of their own, that the blueprint for their happiness is already inside their life and they have to kind of bring it forth. And we share that. And we also share, I think, a deep sense of sorrow and melancholy and the difficulty of life. And um, so it was a profound meeting of the minds when we met, just chat and the simple chant together, which became a five-hour meeting. And we wrote, began writing songs together. That was the beginning of 99 and we're still doing it. Um, now we both branched out and work with other partners as well, but we have a number of pieces. We have a new um, musical we're working on now, and we have musicals we've been working on for years that still haven't, like we have a musical about the Roman Emperor Nero, which feels very timely right now, um, <laughs> which we, um, you know, we're back. We've never, it's never fully been staged. It's had workshops. It's had, you know, we've done work on it, but we're, st we're still at it. Oh, cool. Um, 
So I read that you wrote um, a screenplay to turn Spring Awakening into a movie. Um, is that still in um, in the works? It is. You may be hearing more about that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I read that and I was so excited because I, I was like, yes, finally I w- will like be able to see Spring Awakening. <laughs> um, I hope that a lot of people will feel that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, have you had one project that you've done that meant the most to you? Well, in terms of my life, in terms of my livelihood, in terms of my um, reach into the world and the effect I've been able to have on other people, certainly that would be Spring Awakening. Um, But again, there are all sorts of ways that something means something to me. You know, so I'm, um, you know, I... I've been working on a novel for years and I'm working on it now through the pandemic and it's been an amazing time for me to get a lot of work done on that. I have um, poetry, which is my first love, which I've also been working on through the, you know, so I have, does it make sense? I have different projects that mean different things. I have, do you know who Burt Backrack is? He's, um, he's perhaps the greatest living composer. He's in his 90s now. He wrote all these amazing songs um, like Alfie or What the World Needs Now is Love and um, Walk On By and I mean incredible songs. Plus he was in the 60s and 70s and it was a dream of mine to meet him and to write with him and now I'm writing with him and we have a musical together and it's called Some Lovers and it brings me so much joy to think about and work on. Um, So I have a lot of um, I'm working on a, a murder mystery musical movie right now. You know, so I have a lot of cool stuff. And I, again, I care about all of it. What I probably, but Spring Awakening has changed my life most. And if you ask me in my heart of hearts what I care about most, I care most about my poetry and my, um, my novel. How's that? Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, so, is, is there a song from Spring Awakening that's the most personal to you? Um, I think, again, I would say they're also personal. Mm. You know, they're all aspects of me and all the characters are aspects of me. You know, there's th- there are three central characters in Spring Awakening. You might see that. One is the bright, rebellious guy who's going to change the world with his own true mind well I kind of was that guy in some way you know I was the I grew up in the Midwest and I was the, the smart kid who was so determined and, but then there's also his friend who is the total who's just hounded and haunted and fails out and it's just a total misfit when everyone saw the show they said oh you put yourself on stage meaning that I was that guy oh. <laughs> then I had many talks with Leah Michelle, who was our first Venla, of how I was Venla. Because I was like, because if Moritz, if Melchior was the mind and Moritz was the body, Venla was the heart. So I think these things become very personal to me. You know, not in a way of like I'm expressing myself, but just like I'm very invested in every moment of what I'm doing. So I really care about all the characters. I think you have to really care about all of them. And I really care about all the songs because every song is precious. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, so how did, um, or how do you decide who um, to cast in your musical uh-huh. sense? It's a very big deal. That's a very big deal. You go through audition processes which can be very extensive and a lot of people have opinions so <laughs> I have opinions and I'm the writer so I have a, a really important opinion but Duncan is the composer he has an important opinion the director is basically the guy who is supposed to make these decisions but we have approval over those decisions 
So he's very invested. The producers want people who are going to sell tickets and they want people and they want to be artists. So they want to feel like they're the ones who are spotting the talent too. <laughs> then there's the theater. If it's not the producers, the theater that's actually producing the show, they come into it. Then there's the casting director who's calling people. They always have opinions. So it's a real process and it's often fraught because people feel different things about different people. For example, Leah Michelle came in to, to audition for us when she was 14 years old. She had just turned 14. She came in and auditioned and she blew me away. Our director was frightened of casting a 14-year-old girl to play a 14-year-old girl because the girl does such inappropriate things in the play. Or not inappropriate, but she's rebellious. And we fought and I won. Years later, the producer didn't want Leah. Duncan didn't want Leah. Michael and I wanted Leah. <laughs> we won. You know, but there were but along the way there are trades, there are compromises, you know. I think with Spring Awakening we got an amazing cast in every role. And we got we got the amazing people we wanted. You know, so it's that's what I would say to you. It's always there's always a lot in that equation that's going on. Oh cool. Um, do you ever um write uh, roles with certain people in mind? I probably should do that more than I do. <laughs> you know, I do that if I'm um, like writing a song with a, for like a pop song and someone says, you know, this song is for whoever it is, Josh Groban. Then I think about that artist when I'm writing it. But when I'm writing shows, um, well, sometimes you have to rewrite things for the actors you cast. You know, um, do you know who Jonathan Groff is, who plays yeah. Malcolm in Spring Awakening? I love Jonathan Groff. <laughs> so he, when we cast him, I had to rewrite Melchior for him. Because mm. he had qualities, he didn't have certain qualities or whatever. He was so good, but he lacked certain qualities that that Melchior had, and he had other qualities that that Melchior didn't have. So that mm. affected how I wrote him, which then affected how I wrote Moritz, because I had to give some of those qualities to the other guy. You know what I mean? So sometimes you shape a role around the actor you cast. Oh. I've done more of that. Oh, cool. Yeah, that makes okay. sense. Um, yeah. Um, do you have a favorite Broadway show? Spring Awakening. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it makes sense. It makes sense. <laughs> yeah. I, that was going to be my answer, Spring Awakening. So. <laughs> um, have you discovered any new like hobbies or obsessions during quarantine? I, you know, it's been such a heartbreaking, outrageous, sad, strange time. For me, it has also been a hugely productive time. And maybe that's writer privilege, but I have been a, I was hospitalized a lot myself. I had a terrible accident when I was 20, and then I was in the hospital for about a year after that. And I've had repeated hospitalizations. And I've learned, like, quiet and solitude I do well with. Because I can go into a place where I really concentrate. And that's what I've done throughout this, this quarantine. I've done so much work. So I've just worked continually. <laughs> I've done... I've rewritten three or four musicals in a significant way. That were like one that I hadn't been able to look at for two over two years because I had just didn't have time. I have two movie musicals. I have my novel. I have poems. I've worked a lot. What I've been doing, I don't really watch movies or TV because when I had my back accident, I at that time gave up all films and TV. I said I want to learn to create things that can last, mm. and I start reading. I read all these novels. I taught myself ancient Greek. I did all this stuff. So I don't really have that habit for film and TV. So I don't watch those things. I know people do, but I don't. Mm -hmm. But what I have found over this quarantine, I've started watching these YouTube videos about paintings that I love. They're called smart history, like art history, but smart history. And they go you know, Michelangelo, Leonardo, Vermeer, great art. They have these short videos about their works, and I've been 
revisiting these paintings that I love and learning about them. I like, I'm a student. I'm very studenty by nature. I like learning things. So then I feel like I'm spending my time profitably. So that's a new thing I'm doing. Oh, cool. Nice. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, what is your biggest pet peeve? Noise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah, I hate it when, like, you know, before all of this, like, uh, when we were actually at school, and I hated being in the hallways when everyone was switching classes, because it was just uh -oh. so noisy and so crowded, um, so I'd always, like, wait back until, like, the hallways cleared, and then it was, like, <laughs> silent and there was nobody that I could like accidentally run into or <laughs> um, that's so. like New York right now what? it's like New York right now oh. New York is so busy and crowded and noisy and you go out and like no one's around oh, it's just wow. so, so empty and it's I will say um, unlike LA in New York people wear masks mm. they really do and I'm really glad they do and it's because our governor has been so intense about it. But when you see people, they're wearing masks in New York, by and large, which makes me feel good. Yeah, that's good. It's yeah. a very good way yeah. to keep everyone safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, my last question for you is, who do you consider to be a real-life superhero and why? Well... I was just talking about the perfect thing for this. <laughs> for me, Michelangelo, for example, is a total superhuman. He lay up there for how many years painting the Sistine Chapel? It's not even that just he endured it, but he created one of the greatest masterpieces humanity can have. I mean, Marcel Proust, the writer, locked himself away. He had a terrible asthma, had terrible respiratory problems. He didn't leave his bed for, for 13 years, and he wrote this seven-volume novel that is hugely important to me in search of lost time. So mm. I have this profound um, admiration for artists who, despite all the obstacles, um, because everybody has enormous obstacles, but despite them, they push on and they create these things these pieces of art that touch hearts and lives, you know, over time around the world. Those are my heroes. Oh, cool. Yeah, um, yeah I love that answer. Um, yeah, well, thank you so much for calling in. I'm just, I'm so starstruck right now. <laughs> I, I had actually um, told one of my teachers, uh, I emailed him like on Friday and I told him I'm interviewing Steven Sado on Monday, like I'm freaking out. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, uh, last night he sent me an email saying you're interviewing Steven Sado tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. Tell him I said hi. I will. <laughs> Thank you so much. Of course. Thank Thank okay. you. All Thank right. you so much for calling in. Thank you for your love. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, Stephen. Bye. Bye.